My name is Sarah Eberhard, and this afternoon I'm speaking with John Lanyers of Monroe, Georgia. He's here this afternoon with his wife, Billy, and we'll be discussing his experiences um, while based on the USS um, Bellow Wood. Bellow Wood. Bellow Wood in World War II. And just to get started, I'd like to ask you about how you uh, came to be in the service. Were you drafted? Did you, were you a volunteer? And, the, and uh, how did that come about? Well, I was in, in school and my daddy in small town, he knew everybody on the draft board. And he ran into one of them one day and they said, you better tell John to do something because we, go, we can't pass him up many more times. So when he did that, I volunteered to the Navy. And where were you, um, where were you sent for training? Or a after you volunteered, um, where did it go from there, such as with your training and your first assignment? I went to Columbia, South Carolina, and we spent three months there in nothing but ground school. And then from there, I went to Auburn, Alabama, where I soloed, flew and soloed Cubs, and then stayed there three months. And then from there I went to Athens pre-flight, and that was mostly ground school and exercise. And then, then from there I went to uh, Memphis, Tennessee for E-Base, Elimination Base. And we flew uh, Yellow Perils. I don't know who made them, it, but flew that for three months. And then from there I went to uh, Pensacola and stayed at Pensacola until I got my wings in commission. And, and what was the date when you were commissioned? August of 44. Okay. And then after your commission, where? Um, I went to uh, Miami, Florida, and we trained. That's where we picked up the. Uh, type planes I was going to fly in combat, and uh, we uh, trained there for three months, and then we went to the west coast to, I, I don't know now whether it was San Diego or somewhere on the west coast, Alameda, and uh, that's where we formed the squadron. And from there we went went down to, to uh, Hilo for three months and trained there and did some night flying and so forth and then we went aboard the carrier headed to the Pacific. How long were you out on the carrier? Oh, if we didn't get there the war was nearly over. Uh, we actually, I was actually aboard the carrier about 90 days. And then, and then we came on back to the west coast, and they they disbanded the squadron. And um, I'm going to take you back again to the um, to the beginning when you, when you first enlisted, um, and uh, when you first joined. What um, you mentioned being from a small town was that here in Georgia? Monroe, Georgia. Okay, that was Monroe, and. Were many, had many of your friends joined or had they been drafted at this point? What was the mood around home and around town for um, the number of you that were going into the service? Well, I, I really don't know. I was in school away from Monroe. Mm -hmm. you went, were you in college or in? No, business school. Business school. Okay. Yeah. And Oh, the reason I joined the Navy, one reason I joined the Navy was that when you, uh, I heard that that was a better flying program than the Army had and a tougher flying program. And at that time, if you washed out, if you went in the Army and you washed out, you were buck private. And the Navy, they'd send you back to your draft board. So that's one reason I liked the another reason I liked the Navy. <laughs> and did you did any of your friends go in with you at the no, same no, time? No, 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 no. I was just by myself. Uh huh. Okay. What about 
What about back at home? How did you uh, stay in touch and in communication with your family? Was there much much difficulty with that? With any any problem with sensors or or getting the time to, to call or to write back home? Oh no, no problem. We we could. Uh, there were some places where we were not allowed to to uh, get in an automobile and ride, and. Uh, my family came over to see me when I was in Athens at pre-flight, and then I didn't see him again until I got my commission, which was August of '44. That was about a year, about a year later. Yeah. Then. Okay. Now, as you as you went through your different um, training, your, the the different locations where you were for training, did did you have any idea of where your your uh, your mission would would end up. Did were you always working towards that, or did you have any idea of what was going on? It was just one situation at a time. Well, no, we didn't know anything. Just whatever phase of training they had at that particular field is what we did, and and that didn't bother us one bit where we were going or what what was going to happen to us. What were at some of the different locations? Could you could you kind of touch on at each location some of the activities you were involved in or the work that you did at in those locations? Well, the main main thing was that uh, Memphis when when we were flying the Yellow Perils, uh, we spent we didn't have much time off to tell you the truth. We just we worked most of the time, and work consisted of flying and ground school. Hey, and what about in what what were your training programs like when you were mentioning the the, the pre-flight in Athens and and I know when you first went to Columbia, the Columbia was the first location. First location. And what was your your training like there? It was strictly ground school and exercise. We'd go to school. We'd go to ground school four hours or six hours a day and have a couple hours of exercise. And, uh, and then on Saturday, on Saturdays we'd go to ground school and have the afternoon off, <laughs> and that's about it. And then it was from Columbia you went to to Auburn, Alabama, Auburn. where we flew Cubs. Okay. And I soloed in soloed in a Cub over in Auburn. Uh -huh. And there again we worked most of the time. And there wasn't a whole lot of free time except at night. Yeah. <laughs> And that was from Auburn to Athens, was it? Right, which was another three months of strictly ground school, and and uh, one thing I remember about Athens was that Peter Rockley they'd put a test in front of us, and we'd say, "Well, what does this got to do with flying?" And they'd say, "We're trying to find out what type personality it takes to be a flyer." And we took those tests. They said, "Don't worry about what you make on them because it's not going to be held against you in any way." But they're trying to find out what type of person it takes to be a pilot. So, so uh, we uh, did did that. Took those tests. And it, I tell you what, the Athens pre-flight was tough. Now they put you through the ring of there. And, and, Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was just tough. It was just just hard. It was, in fact, it had the reputation of being the toughest uh, pre-flight in the, the United States. And was that a lot a lot of written tests, or was it the physical, or what what uh, what what type of testing were they running you through there? Oh gosh, I don't remember. It was just all anything that pertained that we needed to learn to fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. And then on to Memphis. Memphis, and that's where we really started in the, on serious flying. That uh, that cub business didn't mean much, uh -huh. but we uh, we really got started there, and I had a very I guess you'd call it a frightening experience. The the base was close to the river, and we got up one morning and the thing everything was clear and 
and the weather was good, and by the time we got down to the flight line and some of the planes had left, fog rolled in, and we lost seven instructors and, and students and 11 airplanes that morning. All in, all in just a few minutes. Yeah, I remember seeing the truck bringing those planes back to the field, and, and they just shoveled them up. It was torn up so bad. And then that was your last. That was where you got your. Where um, you where you completed your training then? Oh no, no, no. We went from Memphis to Pensacola. That's right. And then we at Pensacola, they had different fields, and we'd take. Uh, instrument training at one field and we'd take uh, gunnery at one field and different phases of training was at a different field. And then they about washed me out about two weeks before I was supposed to get my commission. And we were on a, on a gunnery flight and there were six students and one instructor and it was my time to lead the flight and we got uh, got ready to come back home and the instructor rocked his wings for us to join up and come on back and I didn't see him and when we got back he chewed me out good because I didn't I didn't rendezvous when I was supposed to and they gave me a down and I went before the reviewing board and I guess that morning there must have been 15 or 18 cadets out there waiting to go in to talk to or well, they had five or six pilots the instructors sitting around and it came my time and I went in there and had a little chair sitting out in the middle of the room and they were sitting over there in these nice lounge chairs <laughs> and uh, they kept asking me different questions and one, one instructor kept saying do you like the night fly I said well I don't mind night flying but <laughs> I'm not in love with it and, and, and then finally he said well let me ask you this, and did you rather night fly or go downtown and have a date? I said, I, <laughs> I'd rather go downtown and have a date. <laughs> and I was one of about three that got, that they didn't wash out that morning. There were about 15 of us standing out in the hall waiting to go in. And then it didn't take but about a week or 10 days after that till we got our commission and wings. And then went on to Miami. Went on to Miami, where we picked up our TBMs, which was what I flew, and uh, we trained down there for about three months, and then we, I believe we had two weeks leave, and, and then we had to meet again on the West Coast, and that's where we picked up the rest of the people that would go be in the squadron, and that's where we formed the squadron on the West Coast at Alameda. Can you tell a little bit more about the aircraft that you flew? The TBM? Uh -huh. Well, at that time, it was considered the largest single engine plane in the world. And if you worked at it and, and everything was in good shape, you might get 150 knots out of it. <laughs> Straight and level, 150 knots, about as fast as it'd go. Big airplane. I had the pilot, I sat up front and, and I had two crewmen. I had a radioman and a gunner with me at all times. There were at least three of you. Uh, always three of us. And of course the radio one didn't have much to do after we after they did away with the where we could use voice. So he really didn't have a whole lot to do but my gunner he sat up in there there was we had a long canopy and uh, he he was up there with a fifty caliber machine gun. And the first first TBM or the first TBFs, only difference in the two planes was one was made by one company and one plane made by another. And we uh and he had a little thirty caliber machine gun back there that he could and it it was so ineffective and all that they just finally quit putting over the board. Okay, and now once you got to San Diego and you formed up your, the, your squadron, your squadron yeah. was formed there. How many of you were there in your squadron? Pilots. Pilots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
pilots. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd have, I'd have to look, look in here to tell you the truth. I've forgotten. What do we have? Of course, we had a, we had a fighter group with us. We, they, I think they had about 24 pilots, and we had about 12, okay. if I remember right, 11 or 12, something like that. And we had, I think we had nine aircraft, and they had 18 or something like that. I may be wrong about those exact numbers. I've forgotten. It's been so long ago. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, as you um, even flip, flip through your book there, can you see anything else about your, your squadron you might want to mention in terms of um, those were all, your, your book there starts with your group from San Diego, right? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's our buddy right there. He, he's going to be at the reunion. Calipetro, the name was okay. Calipetro. He was an electrician, enlisted man, but he, he comes to every reunion. He doesn't miss one. Oh, and when we got to, when we left the West Coast, went under the Golden Gate Bridge, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up in Hawaii, and from there we went on down to Hilo. Hawaii, and we trained there for about three or four months, and then we headed to the Japan. And what was your specific, um, uh, I know you mentioned it was towards the end of the war when, when you um, got out um, on your mission. What were some of the, the specific things that you were accomplishing or that, that you were working on once you got out there? Well, of course, uh, TBM, we were supposed to, we had we could carry a torpedo or we could carry bombs. And I, and I flew in the morning and uh, I went to bed most of the nights thinking we would have a torpedo and then sometime during the night they'd change our payload to, to bombs. And we, did, we mostly bombed uh, in and around Tokyo and down toward uh, Hiroshima or Hiroshima whichever way they pronounce it. And uh, in fact, I was, we were supposed to fly, drop bombs on some shipping right out of Hiroshima. We went to bed that night. We'd always brief at night before we'd fly, because we'd fly, get out in there and, and be in the air by about daylight and in the morning. And we, uh, we were supposed to drop bombs on it and retire right over the city, real low, because they couldn't, couldn't uh, lower the anti-aircraft guns down that low. And they said, under no circumstances can you fly over the city. The last minute they told us we could not fly over, the, over Hiroshima. And we lost a plane and a pilot that day because of that. And we had to retire in a different route. And I was lucky I, I made it all right. And you were basically doing these kinds of runs over the, so about a 90-day period that you were yeah. there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we would fly. Oh, I, I've forgotten now how many days we'd fly. Then we'd pull back for refueling and reprovisioning. Then we'd move back up and drop more bombs. And, and how late, um, um, when um, did you finish up at that point? that you came back? Well, we finished up when the war was over after they dropped the atomic bomb, this, the second one. In fact, I, I felt a concussion from the first one. I was in the air going back to the carrier after dropping bombs. And we, we felt that, uh, that uh, shock wave from that first uh, uh, atomic bomb. And, uh, then when when that squared away, they 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 opened all the POW camps and yeah. painted a P, big PW on the prisoner of war on the top of the building where they stayed. 
and we dropped supplies to them for now, I don't know how many missions I made for that, but we we dropped uh, medical and food supplies to them. Of course, the gates were open and they could leave any time they wanted to, but there's no place for them to go. And and then we pulled into Tokyo Bay, and and uh, I was in a 1500 plane formation that flew over the big mole when they signed the peace. Now, were you involved with transporting any of the POWs? Oh, no. No, no. Town? No. We had one boy named Herb Law that got shot down, and he was a prisoner of war. But he didn't he, he, he didn't stay in, in a prison camp long because the war ended, and they turned them all loose. In fact, we didn't see him again until we got back to the States. Now, did you spend in, any time in Japan, um, itself or were you, were you out pretty much? Well we were anchored in Tokyo Bay and, and yeah they would allow so many of us to go ashore each day. Just so many and, and we had to take our own water and our own food if we, we couldn't eat anything over there. We couldn't drink the water and uh, that that made it a little bit awkward but and we, we walked around in a we didn't go into Tokyo, but uh, there was some place, some city, I forget the name of it now, south of Tokyo, on the, on Tokyo Bay. And uh, we were walking around, just, and we get, first thing we knew, we were in a residential section, and we just go in the, in the houses, and, and they'd hide from us, the women, and, and if there were any men there, they'd hide from us. They didn't, they, we didn't see any of them because I guess they were just afraid of us. And this was at a point after everything had, had oh, yeah. finished up. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then they brought us back and put us off on uh, Guam, I believe it was, in an R&R &R camp. Uh -huh. and what was it, that like? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do. <laughs> Drink liquor and and do nothing. And how, how long were you there? That I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But we were waiting on a ship to bring us back to the States. Mm -hmm. See, they disbanded the squadron okay. when the war was over. And I, I guess the squadron was disbanded, but we were all on the same ship coming back to the States. Mm -hmm. We came back to the West Coast and got to the West Coast when Navy Day is in September, isn't it? And we got back to the West Coast a few days before Navy Day. And was the the group the, in, in your squadron, were these people that you had come all through the training with pretty oh, we, much? From the yeah, we picked, we, I picked up most of the pilots. We got together in Miami uh -huh. and stayed together. When we went to the West Coast, we were all put in the same squadron and picked up some old people too, but there wasn't enough of us to fill the, the quota. So we, uh, we, we picked up our skipper and our executive officer and, and some of the other people that had been in longer than we had. Mm -hmm. And were these mostly um, all Southerners from this part of the country? Oh, no. Here, you have oh, no. Them, you know? oh, no. In fact, I've never been able to locate one of my crewmen. His name was De Tulio, and he was, he was, nobody's been able to find him since then. And he was from up north somewhere. I don't, I don't remember where exactly, but then my other crewman was from South Carolina, and he died of cancer some years ago. Right, and now you, you mentioned you, um, when, when did your, um, Groups start getting together for reunions. Been about 15 years ago now, mm -hmm. and I've made every one of them except the first one. And I was sitting there at home uh, watching television, and the telephone rang, and, and it was this boy from South Carolina he called and said, "You know who this is?" No, he said, "What were you doing a certain day in the past?" And I said, "I have no idea." 
<laughs> he said, well, we were flying together. Uh-huh. And uh, I, uh, he said, well, we're going to have a reunion in Jacksonville, Florida. I believe it was, wasn't it? Wasn't it Jacksonville? Yeah. And uh, I said, well, I'm going, just like yeah. that. And when I hung up the phone, and Billy was in the back taking a shower, and uh, when I went back and told her, she said, well, we're scheduled to go on a trip to New Orleans, I believe it was, and I missed that first one, but I've been to every one since. Thank goodness. <laughs> and and how, how have those reunions, how, how have they been? Have, have there been a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, do you, you go over a lot of things from then, or is it more about being in the present, or what? what, what? No, no, the, the, the stories get bigger and longer <laughs> every, every reunion, mm-hmm. and wilder. Uh-huh. And you have different, pretty much everybody's continued to come to all of them, and... Same, yeah, the same ones, mostly. A lot of them never have shown up. But really, it was a ship's reunion. It was anybody that was stationed aboard the Bella Wood during the war. But because we we were, I think we were about the fourth or fifth squadron that had been stationed aboard, and then another squadron took over when we left, and uh, we always just sort of gathered together, had our little reunion within the reunion, mm-hmm. because we knew each other real well, and it's been a lot of fun all these years. And how has it been? Because I know um, some of the other World War II veterans I've talked to. Um, felt an impact, I don't know if you or, or maybe some of those that you served with, with a lot of the attention that started coming back around with when the book The Greatest Generation was published and and there was, you know, more attention and, and um, brought, brought about the time that you served. Did that? I don't think, I don't believe we ever mentioned that at a reunion. We may have, may have talked about it. I don't remember that part of it, but I read the book. And what did you think of that? Oh, I thought it was a great book. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good book. The only only thing that I didn't like about it was that everybody that he talked about in the book went on to become sort of halfway famous. Uh-huh. And I I thought he left out a lot of the, the old, this is common old soldier and sailor. I think some of those they picked up in some of the follow-up follow-up books later yeah. on. He did a couple of them. But I know that, that um, some people have mentioned that it was when, when that came about that they were able to tell their story and interested yeah. in, in, um, in talking about it a little bit more. Now, after um, after you were out of the service, can you tell me a little bit about your um, serving in the reserves after you were out? Yeah, I stayed in the reserves about oh, 12 or 13 years and in fact, I've got uh, 17 years and nine months of satisfactory federal service. But uh, we were getting some age on us, and we were—they were, they let us stay in be- until the younger boys had, that had joined and been in the fleet would come back, and they gave them our spot in the reserves, and we had to get out. Mm-hmm. And what type of... Um duties did you have in the reserve? Just flying. Mm-hmm. We'd go up one weekend a month, Saturday and Sunday, and then two weeks active duty in the summertime. Were you at the different bases around the south? or was? Oh yeah, one? yeah. Well yeah, I, we spent two weeks, I remember two weeks in Miami and two weeks in New Orleans and and it was two weeks somewhere else I didn't, I don't remember going to some way up the coast. And they went, they even flew to the west coast one time on the two weeks active duty, which I didn't go. Something came up that I couldn't go and I, di- I didn't get my two weeks with them. But it was very unorganized reserves when I first got in. We'd just go up and just sign out an airplane, go fly around, do what we pleased. And then it finally got organized and we got some good training. I know you brought the um, got the the two books with you here. One of them is your squadron, and the second one is. Tell me about the Bellwoods. 
Oh, th these were the different squadrons that served on... Um, on the Battle of Wood, yeah. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the tape for a minute because I want to check on um, how they want to capture some images from the book here. Okay, we're back. We're back in business then. <laughs> and if I could just get you to um, tell us this particular book you're looking at is the book about your squadron. That's, that's right. We had that. We all pitched in and published that at the end of the war. showing your your um, the different crews like you were talking right. about each you had a each each one of us had two crewmen and that's that's they were permanently assigned to, to us I mean we didn't swap crewmen around we kept the same ones all the time and some of these I can't see it upside down some of these people are, are the ones that show up at the reunion every year uh -huh. and so how many different crews did you have there I, 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 I don't, I left. Well, that's not that bad. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's where we started. There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we had about 12 pilots, if I'm not mistaken. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. More than that, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, some of these people are the ones that show up. I flew with this man right here. The car. He was my group leader. And now, these were, you said you lost one crew when you were over there? Is that correct? Or? Well, we lost one on that combat mission and then we lost one when we were dropping supplies in the POW camps he got too low and uh, spun in. Okay. So you lost one crew and what's some of the other information there that they that you have in the book you've got your information about your different crews there and um, mostly just pictures of parties and <laughs> And so forth that, that, that we periodically the officers would give it would put the bill for the enlisted men to have a party, and it was wild sometimes. Uh -huh. <laughs> All of us were young and no okay. responsibility, and <laughs> it was rough. Having a, good, having a good time. Oh yeah. Yeah, you had um, a picture. Was it your insignia? Um, was that in the There's the best one, I think. Okay, yeah. Now, now, who came up with that? How did you uh, get your... Uh, that I don't know. We just, that, I guess we just sort of had a contest or something, or somebody thought it up. But we... Uh, and there's, there's, there's a picture of each one of us. Uh, There's a lot of fighter pilots on here, too. I never have really paid much attention to this book. But it shows it. That shows it. 